Welcome uh, to the uh, this week's uh, edition of our noon interdisciplinary conference, and it is uh, an honor for me to introduce our speaker today, who is well known to many of us here uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Monica Peake is the Ellen H. Block Professor of Health Justice at the University of Chicago and also an Associate Director of the McLean Center. Uh, Dr. Peake is a graduate of Johns Hopkins Medical School and completed residency at Stanford, um, has been on the faculty now for how many years, Monica? I've lost track. A while, a, a while. Uh, so uh, Dr. Peake's research pursues health equity and social justice with a focus on promoting equitable doctor-patient relationships among racial minorities, integrating the medical and social needs of patients, and addressing healthcare discrimination and structural racism that impact health outcomes, specifically, for example, diabetes and COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Peake has authored over 150 peer-reviewed papers um, has served as principal investigator for multiple grants, 
from institutions such as NIDDK, NHLBI, PCORI, AHRQ, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, along with Greenwall Foundation, the Merck Foundation, among others. Um, in addition to being the Associate Director of the McLean Center, uh, Dr. Peake is Associate Director of the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translational Research, the Executive Medical Director of Community Health Innovation, um, and she is a senior associate editor for the journal Health so Services Research and a member of the National Academy of Medicine. So today, uh, Dr. Peek will speak on clinical medical ethics and human rights. Welcome, Monica. Super excited to be here. Thank you all for coming out um, with it being like three degrees. Um, so, so yeah, today I'm hoping that we can have a bit of a discussion if possible. So I'm gonna talk, but um, I've thrown, I have a couple of slides with some questions that hopefully we can um, either address in real time. And then I have them sort of again at the end. And uh, I'm technically challenged, so we'll see how this goes. Oh, I'm supposed to lean into the microphone also. Already getting challenged. I know, I know. Ha, huh. okay. <laughs> so simple. Okay, um, so I just always like to start um, by giving a thank you to all the places I sit on campus. Um, but today I am also representing um, Physicians for Human Rights. Um, so that's an or organization um, for the past year. I've been on the board of directors and previous to that I was on the Physician Advisory Council. Um, and so I say that because, uh, for, well, for lots of reasons, uh, one of which many of the slides have come from Michelle Heisler, um, who is the current medical director. Michelle is like one of us. She is a clinician. She's an internal medicine physician. She's a health service researcher. And like myself, a lot of her work had previously been in diabetes, but she'd always had a passion for human rights, particularly international human rights. And so she uh, still works at the University of Michigan, but spends a lot of her time in New York City um, being the medical director for uh, Physicians for Human Rights. And so um, she's brought some of her friends <laughs> to, to be on the board, um, which even though it's a Physicians for Human Rights organization, because a lot of our work has to do with legal issues, many of our board members are lawyers and our current uh, chair is a lawyer and also has a PhD. And I also just wanted to give a shout out to Dr. Uh, Robert Lawrence, who is one of the founding members, um, is currently a uh, board member emeritus and a past board chair. And I met him, I think in like, uh, before 2000, <laughs> many years ago. Um, and he's just been so generous with his time, such a, a dedicated um, servant to social justice. And it's really been an honor to work with him again. All right, let's see here. So today's my roadmap. I'm gonna talk um, briefly about clinical medical ethics uh, because you guys are here, so I don't have to elaborate on that. Health and human rights, physicians and human rights, and then sort of walk through four sort of case studies about some of the work that PHR has done. Um, and then have us think together about the implications for what we as clinical medical ethicists um, might do, what our role might be, um, et cetera. So you'll sort of see what I'm talking about. All right, so I always have these slides in my talks just to reorient myself and everyone else who might be watching or listening, um, which hopefully is all of you. <laughs> Um, uh, just a little set. So clinical medical ethics is a medical field that helps patients, families, and health professionals reach good clinical decisions by taking into account the medical details of the situation, the patient's personal preferences, values, socioeconomic considerations, and ethical concerns. It examines practical ethical concerns that arise routinely in encounters among patients, families, healthcare professionals, and healthcare institutions. There are four key ethical principles that of beneficence, so you know, doing good, maximizing a patient's well, well-being and health, non-maleficence, uh, do no harm, <laughs> reducing or avoiding patient harm, um, autonomy, respecting 
uh, or respect for patients' ability to make decisions for themselves, and then justice. Uh, we sort of define that in ethics as ensuring fairness. And so we'll talk a bit about what that might look like. So then thinking about human rights, um, and we think that they are inherent to all human beings, every human being, regardless of who you are, where you sit, how you, rep, uh, how you present yourself, a universal human right. Um, and there's a range of fundamental protections, the right to life, the right to be free from torture um, and ill treatment. Um, some of these are uh, positive rights. So the right to necessary, that are necessary for a dignified life like health, housing, education. Um, and some of them have been sort of codified into laws or covenants or treaties, conventions, et cetera. Um, so then they can, can, can become enforceable or there's some accountable agency or body. Um, and so there are connections between health and human rights. And so this is sort of a Venn diagram um, because some human rights um, may have a direct implication for your health. I'd say almost all of them do, but some may have a less of a direct impact on your health. So what is unique in our role as physicians? Because a lot of people who think about human rights aren't physicians. Many of them are lawyers, are social scientists, are you know, caseworkers. Um, just uh, many people come to the field of human rights who aren't physicians. So what do we have that is unique to offer? Um, and so, uh, a lot of times we have a different kind of moral high ground or ethical high ground that we can sit upon, which is why I'm talking about it here in this context. Um, but we also are trained as clinicians. And so we actually have school skills and tools that can be applied to patients in need whose health has been harmed. So we have the clinical expertise and the use of scientific evidence to document violations of human rights and their health effects. Um, and so many of you may think of Physicians for Human Rights and like, oh, that's the group that does like physician asylum cases a lot. Um, and I actually spent a good bit of my time, consider my life as many of you might, sort of pre-children and post-children. So much of, <laughs> or when I had free time and when I no longer have free time. And <laughs> so pre-kids, I uh, did a lot of uh, human rights uh, asylum cases uh, for PHR. Um, before I sort of joined officially as the organization and leadership. Um, we have uh, the per, uh, perception of having objectivity, rigor, and credibility. Um, our profession is guided by professional ethical obligations. We have specific training uh, to assess and seek, uh, to assess and seek uh, methods to alleviate pain and suffering. We're often at the front lines um, where we can witness health harms from violations, particularly if we are working in urgent or emergent care situations. Um, if we have chosen to volunteer to travel um, abroad and work, um, particularly in uh, areas of conflict or war, or just in areas that are um, in natural disasters, areas just of need um, because of structural violence. There's, you know, an absence of a lot of infrastructure and, you know, some of the things that I was just mentioning, the, the right to water, clean, you know, clean, clean water, housing, et cetera, where there may be less of that. And we actually don't even have to leave the country to experience those things. We have those conditions in this country, um, but every country has a tendency to not really have the ability to look internally, <laughs> to, to look fully at itself and see our own um, limitations. We like to go abroad and see other people's limitations. Um, and so, <laughs> so many of the challenges that we can more clearly see in other countries, we have right here at home that we could be addressing. Um, we do have as physicians, the influence and reputation of uh, being the good doctor. Um, and uh, the inter we have the, the, the international language um, of, you know, doctor speak, which is its own language um, and communication. And then we have an international community that can be mobilized. We're using the same skills and tools. And actually just um, last week or two weeks ago, I got an email from our Dean, Vinnie Aurora, 
someone had reached out to her from Stanford and someone had reached out to him from um, an area of conflict in the world. And so they were friends. He knew Vinny and he said, I, I'm assuming you know Monica Peak um, because she's on the board of PHR. I'm trying to get a message from this person around the world. And so we're an international small community and uh, that's uniquely connected. So Physicians for Human Rights, we work at the intersection of medicine, science, um, that's blocked over there too, um, and justice uh, to secure human rights uh, and justice for all. So we were founded in 1986 by a group of physicians. Um, and this guy here is Bob Lawrence, uh, the one, uh, oh, and him over here too. Oh, I guess my point, my ability, I'm geographically challenged, just got in the corner. <laughs> Um, so he was, I wanted, again, the founding member. Um, so health professionals with their specialized skills, their ethical duties, and credible voices um, who have been uniquely positioned to stop human rights violations. And it re really, really has been an honor this past year um, to move to the board of directors and see firsthand um, the reports as they're about to be launched, the amount of work that has gone into them. Um, and to sometimes be involved in them before they hit the press and just the magnitude, the dedication. It's its really, it's been crazy. It's, it's, it's incredible the amount of work that we're doing and how effective we've been able to be in lots of spaces and places. So um, we work to investigate and document the health effects of human rights violations, to amplify the voices of survivors and witnesses, and to provide evidence to ensure that perpetrators are held accountable. Um, and we collaborate with hundreds of partners around the world. We could not do the work without lots of places on the ground, people whose lives are literally at stake. Um, and we have had multiple times when there were people who were um, conferencing in. Any, and I'm just going to just say this up front. Anyone who's seen me talk, there's a 75% chance you've seen me start crying. <laughs> I just like my feelings are just like always right here. Um, so that probably will, I, I'm realizing I'm about to have that happen right now and I'm just like getting started. So just a heads up warning. Uh, um, but many times we've had people who have conferenced in and they have been in secret locations where they could not even tell us where they were because their life would be at harm in harm's way but they were doing such important work that it was critical that they still be involved in documenting the things that were happening. And so we are privileged to be sort of a, a large national and international banner, but there's absolutely no way that we could do our work without people who have literally sacrificed their lives to make sure that the work gets done. So we have lots of sort of key issue areas um, and the methods that we use um, to defend and document human rights. And I, and I list them here because these are things that are skills that you may think, I have these skills. I can do clinical assessments. I can read x-rays. I can you know review medical records. I know how to do cross-sectional population-based surveys and do systematic reviews. These are not things that are unfamiliar to anyone in this audience. They're the bread and butter of clinicians, of clinician investigators. You know, they're, they're what we do. It's why Michelle, who is basically my clone <laughs> as far as her skill set, is the medical director of PHR. And so I say this to encourage all of us, you know, who are ethicists. So that's an extra level of training. Um, to consider expanding how you see yourself as an ethicist in the world, into the world of human rights. So uh, this is uh, again sort of our, our, our the categories of work that we that we do. Um, a role of documenting torture and ill treatment, um, supporting claims for political asylum, a role in providing medical care for all without discrimination, and a role in documenting attacks on health care workers and health systems, and a role uh, for health professionals in documenting and fighting against what we call dual loyalty. And so that 
may be obvious, may not. We're going to have uh, two of our case studies going to be in, in that space. These are obviously not mutually exclusive categories. Um, and so uh, some of our cases are, are in two categories, and we'll talk about those. So we're going to jump right in. Um, so I bring this up because many people, who knows, this is how I, I had always thought about it, is that think about human rights violations as things that primarily happen in international countries, other places. Um, and certainly that changed with Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. um, but generally we think about all of these horrors as, as not really happening here in the US. So we had um, a report uh, that came out within the past year about, um, not, not within the past year, obviously, because Trump is not the president. So like my sense of time is all fluid, um, but I said the past year because I've only been on the board of directors the past year. Within the past several years, um, and we were still under the Trump administration, so I was on an advisory board then, about um, people who were being separated at the border. And so PHR analyzed uh, 31 medical legal affidavits of parents and children um, up to a year after experiencing their separation um, and all continue to show symptoms of PTSD, depression, and or anxiety stemming from that single traumatic episode of the forcible separation. In all of the cases, the government's, our government's actions met the legal standards for torture. Um, so discriminatory actions that cause severe pain and suffering with the intent to punish, coerce, and intimidate asylum seekers to give up their claims to um, and to defer future asylum seekers. So one person said, every night I would go to bed alone, I was sad and I would cry to myself. And this was a six-year-old girl from Guatemala who said she felt abandoned after being separated from her mother. Um, and so uh, this is just a picture of a shelter for migrants um, in Tijuana, Mexico. Um, and so in this case, all of the asylum seekers interviewed described gratuitously cruel, gratuitously cruel and inhumane treatment at the hands of the U.S. government, including physical and verbal abuse by U.S. officials, inhumane detention con uh, conditions, active deception about their expulsion and whereabouts of their family members, and whereabouts of their family members' active deception and unsafe returns that put people um, at heightened risk of harm. So putting purposely returning people into harm's way when they know, when they have just divulged where harm's way is. Um, and so uh, this was uh, a report in July of 2021, neither safety nor health. So how the Title 42 expulsions harm health and violate rights. Um, the use of clinical and health knowledge to document and denounce poor health conditions in U.S. immigration det detention centers. So um, praying for hand soap and masks. So just how few there were in the detention centers and how that um, contributed to the spread of COVID during the pandemic. And so this was just a, a, a panel. I did a bunch of panels during the pandemic. Um, just about lots of different things, COVID disparities, et cetera. And this is one of the panels that they had about uh, COVID and de detention conditions. And we know that um, congregate living um, is a, a huge risk factor for the spread of COVID. And in our country, we tended to prioritize um, the elderly who were also at high risk, um, but the elderly living in nursing homes or other kinds of congregate living. And we had a really difficult time thinking about people who were in jails or prisons or detention centers because of our country's inability to put public health and public risk ahead of our social um, commitment <laughs> to thinking about um, worthiness and um, um, punishment. And so many, despite recommendations, many people who were in congregate living and who 
should have gotten vaccinated did not. Um, many people who are in congregate living did not receive appropriate masking um, and the rates of death um, within uh, prisons and jails was exorbitantly high. And there, I'm not sure if any of y'all saw pictures of, of signs that people had on the outside of their jail cells, like we're dying in here, please let us live, you know, et cetera. Um, and then there was a study by a former medical student here about the impact of jail cycling on COVID in our communities here in Chicago, where people were um, the over-policing in our community um, was leading to people getting arrested, but not on things that would lead them to be arrested and kept in jail for long periods of time or in prison, just temporarily for like things like protesting Black Lives Matter. So they would be arrested, their masks were taken away, they would be exposed to COVID, they'd be released into the neighborhood, COVID would spread. And so the, the magnitude of the effect size of that jail recycling was a larger contributor to COVID disparities than almost any of the other disparities that were being measured here in our city in Cook County Jail. So immigration, detention, these kinds of things. So what is our role as clinicians? Um, do we provide substandard medical care and be complicit within these systems? Do we just refuse to participate unless the standards are improved? And this is this kinds of question are ones that have been analogous throughout history for physicians. Um, we think about the death penalty cases and how they're continuously being botched. You know, you patients who've been, you know, paralyzed, but they're still awake because they can't figure out how to get the medicines right, or, you know, all the way back to, you know, Nazi Germany, you know, and the physicians that were complicit there. And so how do we as healthcare professionals decide, are we going to go into this horrible system and try and make it just a little better? Or do we say, no, we're not going to participate at all until there's no system? You know, you, you can't do this because you clearly don't know what you're doing um, unless you're doing, you know, things differently. And so that's, that's a question I want to throw out to the group. What is our role as clinical medical ethicists? And so when I say that, I sort of think institutionally because you know, seeing patients. How do our roles change from just merely a provider of care? And how do we interpret beneficence and non-maleficence um, for uh, patients in this situation where you're trying to do no harm or maximize patient benefit for people who are in detention centers? And that sort of is getting back to that same question I was just asking. Um, and does patient autonomy even exist for people who are living in these conditions? And then what is our role as global ethicists? Um, and meaning that is clinical medical ethics something that we even do outside of our institution? Is that something only for patients for whom we have direct clinical care? I would say obviously not, <laughs> but it's something that I want us to challenge ourselves to think about. So next um, I'm gonna, talk about attacks on the role in documenting attacks on healthcare workers and systems. And I'm going to use uh, Ukraine because we published a, a study on that, a report on that about almost exactly a year ago. Um, and that was looking at the attacks that had happened over a period of a year. And so, so about the start of the, war, the, start of the war um, for a year. Um, and this was um, research that was done in collaboration with a number of other organizations. And these were some of the people that um, were in hiding um, when they were coming to meetings or would be um, on TV, uh, but from undisclosed locations, et cetera. Just incredibly, incredibly brave people. Um, and so for that first year, well, uh, up until like the end of December of 2022, these were the number of healthcare uh, facilities and attacks that were taking place in that country. Um, and so it's uh, the attacks on healthcare were a daily feature during the first weeks of the full scale Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and for 35 days, healthcare was attacked every single day. 
between February 24th and the end of December, which is where I showed you that map, there was an average of more than two attacks on healthcare each day. So they were really trying to um, cripple the healthcare system. And so that was um, one of the, the strategies of war, the, the active strategies of war. And so these are just some scenes um, that some of the hospital workers and medical personnel took. And so obviously uh, the attacks dim diminished access to care, reduced vaccinations rate, vac vaccination rates were in the, in the middle of the pandemic when this was occurring. Um, diminished the ability to manage, uh, to manage chronic disease um, and increased financial barriers. As of uh, December of 2022, so right before the report came out, almost one fifth of Ukraine's population reported insufficient access to healthcare services and medication. Obviously, the war is still ongoing. These numbers have only worsened. And so, one of the things that PHR um, has been trying to do, and particularly with the report, was to try and make the case um, at The Hague uh, for accountability for war crimes and crimes against humanity um, using the International Criminal Court, Ukrainian criminal law, universal jurisdiction, and the, the UN Independent International Commission of Inquiry. Um, so using multiple different um, legal mechanisms around the world um, but all, to, to, to try and make this case. Um, and so, in addition to the report to being, you know, on multiple multiple media venues, um, Michelle, as a uh, clinician investigator, has also been really instrumental in um, tapping into the medical literature. And so, um, this is an editorial in the BMJ. Um, there are things in JAMA, The Lancet. Um, and the Lancet has always been much more uh, progressive and sort of thinking about um, sociopolitical factors that impact health. Mm -hmm. um, and so have been great partners. And I will say that um, there has been a lot of controversy uh, about what's happening in Gaza. And so uh, I'll just note that on October 13th, PHR um, made a statement about the attacks by Hamas. And October 17th, it made uh, a statement about the impact of what was happening um, on the devastating hospital strikes. And so while I'm not allowed to sort of comment on current ongoing things that we're doing until they're you know published, I will say that we believe that war and victims of war um, that, that uh, war is a public health issue and that victims of war are, are people that deserve medical attention. So war and conflict, what is our role as clinicians? When and how do we decide to provide humanitarian medical aid to victims of international war? What is our role as clinical medical ethics, as ethicists institutionally? Do we have one <laughs> for war that's outside of our US borders? And then what are our role as global ethicists? What are the opportunities to use our skills as ethicists, health services, researchers, and thought leaders to impact the global narrative that's, that happens? And, you know, there's war raging all the time across the globe, um, all the time. So then I'm going to talk about um, two cases of dual loyalty. And I use these because they're ones where we have been doing work here at home, which is really important uh, for lots of reasons, but also to, um, to highlight that mirror for our ability to take a deeper look at ourselves, right? Um, and to see what is happening here at home and not just always be the, the warrior abroad. So um, what is dual loyalty? It's when health professionals find their obligations to their patients, or what we owe to our patients, and direct conflict with their obligations 
to a third party that holds authority over them. So your boss. <laughs> um, and so here, uh, even though I didn't talk about it in that way, as I said, you know, that they're multi, these are not mutually exclusive categories, but the challenges of providing uh, of, for health professionals and providing care to immigration detainees. So the first case um, or situation um, involves dual loyalty and also the provision of medical care for all without discrimination. I'm just gonna pause and let you guys ponder what I might be <laughs> getting ready to talk about. So it's the excited delirium and police uh, deaths or deaths in police custody. Raise your hand if you've heard of the term excited delirium. Okay, so you held your hand the longest. I know you're like, me, what? No, my God. <laughs> I saw your eyebrows go up in shock and horror. Um, do you wanna, and you don't have to, um, cause I just appreciate you volunteering to like, yeah. Um, but if you feel comfortable, do you wanna share what excited delirium means or what you've heard about it? And you can, you can shake your head now. So I'm gonna say what I thought I heard you say, and you nod your head if that was correct, that there's sort of an autonomic hyperreactivity, sort of delirium that can lead to death um, in circumstances that uh, might otherwise not, um, and that uh, there's some controversy around it, and um, may maybe something else. <laughs> Nodding for the maybe something else. <laughs> okay. That is exactly right. And it sounds kind of nutty because it is nutty. Um, but it's the I so <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna walk you through I'm, I'm gonna walk us through all of that. So these are people um who were claimed to have died from excited delirium. And uh the ultimate finding from our report was that it's not a valid independent medical or psychiatric diagnosis and should be not should not be used as a cause of death. So um, what methods did PHR use in sort of making this determination? Ones that we all have. We reviewed the literature, we read, you know, documents, and we interviewed people, right? These are not things that you all are unfamiliar with. Um, So the origins of excited delirium just sound too ridiculous to be true, but they are. Um, they started in 1990, where the Mi Miami Herald had, well, there were there's some deaths of black women. And when we think about the intersectionality, which is people who have multiple marginalized social identities, um, the more that you have, the higher your risk of poor health and you know being pushed to the you know the most extreme margins where society cares the least about you and is willing to come up with all these reasons why somehow you're to blame for these bad things happening to you rather than structural things being in play. So black women were dying and there's not a lot of societal worth for black women. And so rather than saying, maybe they're being murdered, like, no, that can't be happening. For some reason, okay, black, and, black women were dying, but there are also some, some men. And so they were saying, for some reason, the male of the species, as though black people are different species, becomes psychotic for some reason, and the female species dies in relation to sex. 
So the autopsies, so these are forensic pathologists, have conclusively shown that these women were not murdered. 70% of people dying of coke-induced delirium are black males, even though most users are white, says the deputy chief medical examiner. Why? It may be genetic. And so the, the hypothesis was that people were taking cocaine and getting so delirious that they would just spontaneously die. And that the women, when they had sex while they were having cocaine, would spontaneously die for genetic reasons, of course. So, so this, this was like, okay, this theory was, was starting to make its way around. Then there was a book published called The Excited Delirium Syndrome. And then Taser bought a thousand copies of that book and start distributing it to forensic pathologists, underscoring the ethical harms of the mismatch of getting into bed with industry and, and what that can possibly mean. And then it just sort of takes off. And in 2009, there's a white paper that was published by the American College of Emergency Physicians. And it's the consensus of the task force that excited delirium is the unique syndrome which may be identified by the presence of, of a distinctive group of clinical and behavioral characteristics that can be recognized in the pre-mortem state. Excited delirium, while potentially fatal, may be amenable to early therapeutic intervention in some cases. So then it becomes medicalized. And it's used and diagnosed almost exclusively by police in the pre-mortem state, that means during police custody, and they'll say that this man has excited delirium. What he's doing is fighting for his life, but because he's resisting, he's delirious. And I'm gonna have to apply more force to suppress him. And um, that happened to many black men in police custody. It happened to George Floyd and it happened to others. But during that time of 2020 was a time of racial reckoning around state-based violence and a lot of publicity around that. And people are like, what, what exactly is this excited delirium business? What's, what's going on with that? People start asking questions and um, so excited delirium is frequently asserted as a, as a defense by police officers who kill people during the course of restraint. But it can't be disentangled from its racist and unscientific origins. Yet state medical examiners have listed this as a cause of death and police have been exonerated on this diagnosis. So in June of 2021, the American Medical Association, which ha just has this horrible history as we all know, but they have been like coming into, you know, the real world, right? So they've had a lot of good people join their team. They have been trying to do right for a while now, you know, I've joined the AMA again. <laughs> so they officially, announced a policy that opposed excited delirium as a diagnosis. The ACEP in 2021 put out a white paper. And then in case you missed it in 2023 said, <laughs> just to say again, <laughs> retracting that statement from 2009. Um, and our report you know, came out. And this was just in October um, when I was in DC, we found out that the governor and California banned excited delirium as a cause of death. And you all can't say this, this makes no sense at all. It is now against the law 
in the state of California for people to use excited delirium. Um, and they attribute or they comment about the American Medical Association. And the first person they quote is Dr. Heisler, our medical director, who is one of us from PHR. So state-based violence, um, and that is what police killings are, are state-based violence. What is our role as clinicians? And then particularly in the setting of this strange history that started in the 80s, hasn't really ended, but is starting to unravel. How routinely of, of excited delirium, how routinely do we challenge diagnoses from other specialties that we may not be fully aware of? Few people in the room had even heard of excited delirium. I hadn't heard of it until I helped with the report to come out. So this is something, you know, I'm an in internal medicine physician. I get patients from the ER. We admit from the ER. I guess, I guess that's probably the point is these patients would have died in the ER or, or died in police custody. I probably, that's why I never see that. But, uh, but just in general, you know, how often if, you know, if, if we have heard a term that's a, something that has been diagnosed in another specialty, would we say, oh, that's that's the realm of that specialty? I'm not quite sure I know what that is, but they're the experts. I'm going to take that and just add it to my list of diagnoses, as opposed to saying, that sounds strange. Like, what happened here? Maybe I should do my own investigation. So that's one thing I challenge us all to do. How do we provide care for patients that are incarcerated? Thank you, Megan. What is our role as clinical medical ethics? ethics I always want to say ethics. Ethicists. How do we bring in and validate the historical and contextual experience of patients' lives into the clinical encounter? How do we do that in a way? Because so often we, people are telling us what has happened but we have some official record from the ambulance driver. There may be a police report as to what actually happened. There may be some other something transfer document, something that's the real story. And we may invalidate what patients are trying to tell us. How do we learn to listen to what people are trying to tell us? The state-based violence that is been happening, has been happening for decades, for hundreds of years. What is different now is that we all have cell phones and we're able to document that. But black people have been saying this all of this time, all of this time. And police have been saying, no, 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 I saw a gun, they were coming at me, there was a reason that I was frightened, but he has 3,000 bullets in his body. You know, <laughs> there are 10 police and it turns out he just had a butter knife. I was so frightened. You know, like the stories have frequently not made sense, but we've made them make sense to us because we have not valued the lived experience and the, and the words of marginalized people who are coming in and telling us something compared to the powerful words and stories of those who have more power. How do we learn to engage in a way that's more meaningful? When we're sharing in decisions, which parties are we sharing in? How do we bring in the ethical principle of justice and how are we defining justice in this, in this way. When we think about our role as global ethicists, how have we, because everyone has been woke, although now we're like, oh, should we be woke? Um, to Black Lives Matter after this, right? And everyone wanted to, you know, do something, be more aware. But have we actively been involved in efforts to change the circumstances in which we have, you know, 
see black people getting killed every every day and it's like no no it's it's just not even noteworthy hear about it on the news have we been involved in social justice movements that challenge state violence against the black community so then the last one um is sort of an alignment between dual loyalty and attacks on healthcare workers and systems. Although I'm not gonna talk about the healthcare worker attacks. I don't have any slides about it, but we know this to be true. And that has to do with uh, providers of abortion care. And so um, this is an issue that is um, here <laughs> in our country that we have taken on as a human rights issue. So following the United States Supreme Court decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization in June of 22, people in the U.S. who can become pregnant are facing an unprecedented human rights crisis. In Dobbs, the Supreme Court overturned the constitutionally protected right to access abortion, leaving the question of whether and how to regulate abortion to individual states. Approximately 22 million women and girls of reproductive age in the U.S., and now that number has risen, now live in states where abortion access is heavily restricted and often totally accessible. And then this briefing details the intensifying human rights emergency caused by this decision and discusses ways that Dobbs contravenes the U.S. international rights human, human rights obligations. There's also a study. Um, it says embar embargo, but it's not. This was a out last year um, called No One Could Say, where uh, members of PHR called around in Oklahoma, which already is a desert for GYN care, and was asking, could anybody tell them what the policies were for accessing emergency obstetric care? You know, what the rules were in light of Dobbs, like, you know, Nobody could really say. That's why they titled it. Well, you know, they were getting referred to other people. I think it might be this, but I'm not sure. Have you talked to, um, you know, no one in the entire state, and that's a large state, um, had, a, had a firm grasp on how this decision would be impacting their providers. Yet there are laws in place that made this illegal. What are providers and patients to do? Many providers in states like that packed their bags and left, which <laughs> meant that patients who are not even thinking about obstetric care don't have the women's health care they need. And many there's, there are providers who lived in surrounding states but would go in to provide care just because it was, you know, a healthcare shortage area. And so we are, you know, creating deficits for everyone in the sort of the short side of policy to keep some people from having access to certain kinds of women's health care. So criminal, the criminalization of, of abortion creates a dual loyalty challenge um, by preventing clinicians from meeting their professional obligations. Um, you know, this, you know, I have this for my patient that I need to treat. I have professional standards, but then the law says I could go to jail. You know, I could lose my license. In some places, you know, neighbors, I mean, this is so great. Neighbors could file suit and start arresting people. It's the nuttiest thing. And so what are we to do? What are we to do? So Louisiana, so I hail from the South, for better or worse. Um, if you know me, I probably hugged you. And that's because that's I'm from the South. Um, but you know, the South is just known for all, for mainly bad things. Um, so Louisiana has the highest rate of maternal mortality amongst all the states, more than 58 deaths per 100,000 live births. 
and Black women account for 39% of the women who, who gave birth in 2019, but 70% of maternal deaths, four times more likely than their white counterparts to experience pregnancy-related death. And, you know, I... have been talking to my daughter who is 15 and telling her that all of my life, I've had the privilege of living in Rome. Not all of my life, but most of my life. So I'm 54, you know, and so, um, but that, you know, it used to be a horrible world for women who had to make very difficult choices and many of them died. And that we're slowly turning back so many freedoms for people who don't have power, including women and racially minoritized people and immigrants, new arrivals. And I'm frightened for her and what her future looks like. So what is our role as clinicians here in Illinois? We have this little oasis. How do we best support patients as Illinois increasingly becomes, you know, an oasis for reproductive rights for women? Are we going to consider providing telehealth for out-of-state women? We had a lot of policies in place for us to do telehealth um, for our patients who lived out-of-state during the pandemic. You know, those restrictions were tightened back up. You know, what are we going to be thinking about um, trying to do for this emergency? For non for non-gynecologists like myself, um, how do we best support our gynecology colleagues? Some of the um, things that are important, I think, is for everyone who's not a gynecologist to think about the impact that this has on their patients. For oncologists whose patients may be undergoing chemotherapy and get pregnant, you know, oncology is not just an old person's field as far as patients. You know, everyone has some stake in the abortion situation, not just the providers who have to provide the abortions. And, but the, but the brunt of the burden is on those colleagues. How do we work together to support them? What is our role as clinical medical ethicists? How does this ruling change perceptions about what's best for patients? How do we do no harm for patients? Um, clinically, socially, you know, there are some patients in some areas that are afraid to even tell their doctors that they're trying to get pregnant. Because what if that is in the chart and then something happens later? They come to the emergency room, their family's with them. You know, there's all of this, like, who knows what my, my, my personal status is. How do physicians ourselves introduce into this decision-making equation about what to do for abortion? Previously, it's been all about the patient's well-being. Now we have to think about our own well-being. Am I going to get sued? Am I going to jail? Lose my license? Never see my kids again? Like, when did that come into play? It's in play now. What are, again, the strategies in our toolkit to help shape the national narrative and national policy to address some of these issues? So that's all I have. <laughs> um, just saying thanks again to all of the people who make this work possible. Um, and then I have those uh, 
these sort of four case bullets again. Uh, what time is it, Peter? Okay. So um, I wanted to like not just have these be theoretical questions, but actually have us discuss them if we, and so we have 30 minutes um, and we have four. Which wall do you all want to do first? Or, or you can be like, you know what? It's cold outside and I don't feel like talking. Can we break it one? And that answer is yes also. Megan? Yes. Yes. Right, exactly, exactly. So I'm just going to summarize that. Um, I missed Grand Rounds yesterday because I was on a campus elsewhere. And so Harold Pollock was chastised for not repeating the, the audience thing. She's like, there's a, there's a lot of dead air in there. And I was like, okay, so note to self. Um, <laughs> so Megan's comment was that, uh, uh, to horribly try and summarize, um, just the idea of the moral injury involved when you try to think about withholding care for the best outcome if you're only doing it by yourself or with a group because there's usually some sort of workaround um, of a group of physicians um, that will, will will take on that job um, and particularly because it is frequently institutionalized where the healthcare institution has decided to take on that job and so then you're not just sort of freelancing but you're reporting directly to your your boss who is saying, we're going to do this work. Um, and so it, it brings in this additional challenges. Um, and so uh, Matt Winia, who works, used to work for the AMA, he used to be here, faculty here, he's now out in Colorado, um, had written a piece around reproductive health and, and was suggesting uh, that we all as physicians should like band together and say, you know, we are basically going to have like a moral protest together and we're not going to abide by these federal laws because they can't send us all to jail sort of the thinking of the civil rights movement like you know you can try and put you know, like we'll just keep you know like uh you if you, you can single one of us out but you can't shut the entire medical profession down 
Um, but it is a challenge because it is so easy to isolate us. And particularly, like I said, when there's one profession that is disproportionately bearing the, the brunt of it. Peter, you had a comment? Yeah, thanks. Absolutely. Many of these slides come from a talk that Michelle gave to medical students. Um, and I was, like I was saying, in my pre-children day, um, I did a fair number of asylum cases that came through Chicago. And um, even though the cases were so black and white in my mind, <laughs> All I'm doing is like, his story sounds horrible. He's got all these scars here on his body. <laughs> that appears to be from, you know, like a cigarette burn. And just, I'm just describing what this person is telling me and what I'm seeing as a doctor. He's missing a leg, <laughs> you know, the, the, the vaginal parts have been sewn together from, you know, like all this stuff. But having a physician document that or be willing to show up in court makes such a huge difference in whether or not that case is gonna go forward or not. And I'm like, I'm, anybody can read and look and see, I'm not doing it. I'm not using special advanced medical skills, you know, um, but the weight of just having an MD say that, say what any normal person on the street would say, carries so much weight. That's what I'm saying, this one, all of these are things everyone in the room already has skills doing, you know how to read, you know, you know how to do whatever. And so volunteering um, to do any of this work, you know, you don't necessarily have to write an op-ed, but so much work is needed to be done. Um, and, you know, Michelle does a lot of her work with medical school, medical student volunteers. If anyone, uh, you know, wants to volunteer and do any of this, you know, work, interviewing people, like all this stuff is just work that needs to be done. You know, anybody can do it. Um, and some of the, you know, those, those panels and things, whatever your level of expertise is, if you're an infectious disease specialist or a whatever specialist, you know, they ask people who are expert in that area, you know, as clinicians or as investigators or whatever, you get, you know, people get called and so, you don't have to be a human rights expert to be able to make contributions. You don't have to be a world renowned ethicist to make contributions. And that's the point of this is that we already have the skills. We already have the skills. Um, we just need to want to do it. Any other comments, answers to any of these questions? I'll just throw questions out there to the audience. Like, have, have you all as clinicians come across 
cases that weren't sort of more clearly within the clinical medical ethics box that we normally think about. Things that may be more like this. And have you, and what and what have you done with that? What what do you think about that? Are you like, ooh, that's not my, or you know, like, or or do you try and squeeze it into the like what what happened? I'm just curious to people's experiences. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the question is, can undergraduates help with some of this work? I believe so. Because, uh, you know, medical students, they're not doctors. I mean, no offense to anybody who's listening here in the room. I mean, so, you know, um, and many of them don't have clinical experience. Um, the ones who have the most time are the preclinical students, like they're summer after their first year. So they're essentially kind of undergrads. So my, my guess is that that would be yes. Say what? Okay. Great, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I got it. <laughs>